Oh, there's Naomi Stewart. Hello. That's what I really like uh, about these online meetings to see uh, each other and like a meeting in real life uh, to see companions from during the class. Okay, why don't we start uh, our sessions? Others might be uh, joining in. Let me welcome you to the ELD MOOC to this afternoon's live sessions on policy. I am Claudia Musekamp and I will be the host for today. Um, I would like to introduce today's speaker to you, Louis Baker, head of the outreach and communications team of the UNCCD in Bonn. Louise Baker is a distinguished speaker with a long-standing experience in working in um, um, sustain sustainability. She has worked with the United Nations and the World Health Organization. So welcome with me, Louise Baker from the UNCCD, please. Hi, Claudia. Hello, everybody. Nice to speak to you. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Um, shall I jump straight into the presentation? Please. Great. So, um, as Claudia said, um, my name is Louise Baker. I'm working with the United Nations Convention to Combat Desertification, UNCCD. We're a part of the core ELD team and are very excited to be part of the ELD exercise. Um, I, um, my background is in political advocacy, so what I'm going to talk to you today is about policy and external relations and how we can take what you've learnt in the ELD context and through this MOOC um, training course and maybe see how that fits into what's going on in this, the, global, uh, the global policy process. I hope it's not too um, distant and I hope you can really see how the evidence that you're collecting in the ELD exercise and the skills that you're learning here can be used moving forward. Um, I'm My first it, slide actually just tells you a little bit about UNCCD. Um, we were established in 1992 or proposed in 1992 at the Rio summit along with climate change and biodiversity. Uh, we actually finally were um, established in 1994 and with a sole legally binding international agreement linking environment and development with the land. Um, we think that the economics of land degradation is a crucial part of what we're doing because it provides the evidence for policymakers to take action on land management. Um, the convention has 195 parties who are working together to improve the conditions of people living specifically in the dry lands, to maintain and restore the soil and lands productivity, and to mitigate the effects of drought. Um, we work very closely with our colleagues at Climate Change and Biodiversity, and they had similar exercises to ELD. Um, but we think that actually, um, really, the challenges associated with the land have, have reached a critical point and we couldn't be talking about anything more important at this stage. Um, there are several challenges that we are specifically trying to deal with and I think uh, have become issues of the moment, if you like. Um, inter they really are interrelated challenges. We're at a tipping point where our relationship with the land is both unsustainable and a threat to lives and livelihoods. And unless we act under climate change and under increasing population pressure, it's only going to get worse. In places like Mali, we're expecting to see um, climate change and degradation impacts on agriculture, for example, undermining food security. And it could lead to losses of around 30 percent in terms of agricultural gross domestic product. That's a huge amount of money. Um, we could be looking at two and a half 
billion people living in parts of the world subject to intense water scarcity. And I think we're very confident that um, better land management and making the case for better land management will help bring people to a place where they aren't living under such water pressure and that their food security is increasingly secure. Um, Essentially, the kind of the main theory is what we're saying is uh, as part of the security discussion as well, is that there is no development without security and no security without development. Land degradation, particularly in the vulnerable dry land areas, is driving poverty and insecurity. And you've seen that with the ELD. And disproportionately, it's the world's rural poor who are most affected. The Netherlands Klingendal Institute recently called land degradation a threat amplifier. It takes whatever underlying threats are out there and it magnifies them. Um, many poor rural and land dependent people have very little choice now about what they can do. So I think the case that you're making for land degradation is very important. But this isn't just a question for Africa and for the drylands. And certainly with the ELD initiative, we're trying to look beyond that and trying to look at different parts of the world. Um, I, the country that I know well <laughs> is the UK. And we can look at the situation in the United Kingdom as one example. Um, British insurers estimated that the cost of the UK floods over two months this last winter was close to 1.2 billion euros. This picture here is of a guy by the name of James Winsdale. His family um, own a farm in Somerset in the south of England. They've owned it for 150 years, uh, three generations. And earlier this year, 95% of it was underwater. In previous years, they've lost hundreds of thousands of pounds. And this year, it will be even worse. Um, it's our choice, though, about how we manage the land and soil. And this is an economic choice. And you've seen that in your ELD analysis. analysis. Um, but we're making some rather strange choices. In the European Union, um, a thousand square kilometres are lost every year for housing, for industry and infrastructure. Every 10 years, the EU paves over a surface area the size of Cyprus. Um, and as well... The, the relationships between countries are also really important. Uh, Europe's land footprint, because we have an appetite for products that require large amounts of land, things like meat, dairy, timber and forestry products, we're consuming land in other parts of the world. Europe's land footprint is now around 640 million hectares a year. That's about nearly 60%, sorry, of the land that um, used to meet Europe's demand for agriculture and for forestry products is now coming from outside of the continent. So I think what we're saying is that land degradation is something that's happening all over the world. And there is a complex web of relationships between developing, developed consumers, rural poor that need to be better understood. And I think... ELD has got an important part to play in that. Um, the challenges, I think, as we're looking at them at the moment, and this is where ELD and this exercise play very well, that law, land and soil are underappreciated and undervalued. You, if, you make, if you know the value of something, you make smarter choices about it. The policy framework, the global policy framework and the local policy framework doesn't match the need. And there really is a lack of capacity to take proven solutions to scale. We're working on some examples at the moment about how we can do it, things like the Soil Leadership Academy. But there's a real gap between um, what we know and what we can make happen. But I do think it's um, the issue of land is an idea whose time has come. This is just a series of activities that are happening throughout the next 18 months um, from um, meetings around the security aspects of land at uh, Co in Switzerland in June, the Climate Change Summit later this year, where we'll look at resilience, uh, the Italian presidency of the EU will look at food security and migration and land a very important part of that, along with the Milan Expo. As Claudia mentioned, next year is the year of soils. 
And we will also, in 2015, look at disaster, renegotiating the disaster risk reduction framework globally. Germany will host the G8. We will agree the sustainable development goals and move towards a global and replacement of the climate, climate change agreements. Eventually, we will also implement the new UNCCD strategy. But as you can see, over the next 18 months, there's an exciting agenda going on. Um, uh, what we think needs to happen for land is that incentives to change the current practices and promote resilience are developed and developed and placed within these international processes. We want to look at incentives that discourage land, degrade land degrading practices, accelerate the adoption of SLM, harmonise policies um, across ministries and agencies dealing with land strengthen the rights to land and investments in that and how we govern the investments in natural resources, strengthen drought policies and climate adaptation and resilience mechanisms. And as I said, the timing really is perfect. And I just wanted to do a little bit of a walk through so you can see where, um, where the kind of the key pressure points are in 2015. Um, we would see that in March 2015, the World Conference on Disaster Risk Reduction is taking place. It's supposed to be about how, um, how the world prevents more disasters. And one of the most impactful disasters is to do with drought and famine. And better management of the land would be a hugely important investment. Unfortunately, when we talk about disaster risk reduction, we tend to talk about the response rather than the prevention. Um, and I think there's a movement now to look at how sustainable land management can be used um, to help prevent the impact of disasters. Later in the year, in September 2015, we'll look at the Sustainable Development Goals and a discussion around whether a target about how we manage land would be helpful in terms of driving, driving global action. And then in November 2015, at the Climate Change Conference of the Parties in Paris, we'll look at both at the role of land within adaptation and mitigation. So 2015 is a very pressured year in terms of um, in terms of where we're going and what needs to be achieved. And I know talking with the colleagues at the ELD Secretariat that we will plan a series of ELD related policy launches of the publications across the year. And I think that's important that the economics of land degradation is involved in these in these policy frameworks. Um, so drought and disaster. Um, drought risk disasters refer to the potential loss over a specified time in the future and in a particular community or society of lives and of worsened livelihoods, reduced health conditions, assets and ecosystem services. Actually, only a few developing countries have formulated and implemented national drought policies. Um, they haven't been mainstreamed into sustainable development strategies, um, and they're not really in line with how they are um, building drought and climate resilient societies. So really, we've seen that progress on drought preparedness and the role that land can play in drought preparedness and disaster risk reduction has been really slow at national level. An integrated national policy that looked at water and land management uh, based on the sustainable use of natural resources, we think would be critical for both of that disaster risk reduction and for um, sustainable development overall. Um, we got some great examples about that that I can talk to you about if if that's a good idea later on. Um, the other the next point on the, the timeline that we talked about was the sustainable development goal process. Um, I'm hoping that most of you have heard about where we're going with the SDGs. Um, the SDGs were an outcome from Rio plus 20. So as I said, the, the, the UN processes, climate change, biodiversity, CCD, were created at um, were created at the first Rio um, the first Rio conference in 1992. So we're at 20 years now. 
Rio Plus 20. And um, there was a real move to move sustainability into the mainstream as an outcome of the, of the Rio Plus 20 process. Um, in paragraphs 205 and 209, they talk specifically about land. And in paragraph 206, they said, we recognize the need for urgent action to reverse land degradation. In view of this, we will strive to achieve a land degradation mutual world in the context of sustainable development. This should act to catalyze financial resources from a range of public and private sources. So the SDGs came about because of an underappreciation of the environment and the impact of environmental degradation on development. But as we move forward and as they're negotiated, bearing in mind the Rio plus 20 outcomes, there is an expectation that um, we will look at um, we will look at getting a target in the SDG process. And we will look at getting a target around land that um, the dry lands can have a share of. Uh, so the dry lands are about 40 percent of the world, but we we still would think that a, a global target on land would be wise. Um, within UNCCD, um, 195 signatory parties, 168 of them report that they're affected by land degradation, including 15 of the G20 countries. We now have a working group on land degradation neutrality that's trying to work on a definition that can be useful in the SDG process and pilot projects in 10 countries. Um, and this will be advising and being providing input into the process in New York. Um, this is really what we would think a, ooh, a land degradation neutral world would be about. It's trying to find a world where when you're losing 12 million hectares of land a year to desertification and land degradation, you've got 4 billion extra people and you need 70% more food. How do you find the balance within that relationship? I think we are looking at trying to find a way to negotiate trade-offs and leverage synergies and optimize the delivery of nature's services among competing sectors. And there's a very, very a sort of an economic choice argument there about how, how you use the land and how you choose whatever you're going to do with your land resources. It isn't really, though, a, a kind of a global target. It doesn't require a new protocol or an international agreement. It's an ecosystems based approach to managing resources. And every country can and every community, in fact, can set their own level of ambi ambition. So following Rio plus 20, the process then went forward to New York and to the negotiating groups at the, the permanent representations to the United Nations in New York. After eight open working group meetings, we had 19 focal areas with the issues that they wanted to look at specifically in terms of development. As you can see, there isn't a specific one on land within this context, and we aren't expecting a specific goal on land, we would expect at some point that there would be a target under one of these goals on land. But the process of negotiation is about limiting the goals and trying to identify a relevant, a relevant targets to go with them. Um, the, they're currently meeting, actually, and discussing the next kind of consolidation of the, the working group areas into specific goals. Um, we hope and currently land degradation neutral world um, is part of the negotiations and is featured under two areas sustainable land management is focused is featured under the agricultural working area and land degradation neutrality under the ecosystem services um, focal area um, however, once the last two working group meetings have taken place, we'll know where we stand. Um, the report of the open working group will contain a proposal and they'll release that at some point in June, July as a sort of draft. And negotiations will start at the time of the UN General Assembly in September this year, and they will last for a year. Um, but 
it's expected that if the uh, targets and goals are included in the draft, then there's a good chance that there will be um, something on land by, by the time the sustainable development goals are adopted. The precursor to the sustainable development goals, the millennium development goals, um, was very successful in terms of realigning investment strategies for um, overseas development aid, but also for private sector in different parts of the world. These um, sustainable development goals are not about the investment from developed countries in the developing world. They're about universal standards and universal goals that everybody can aspire to. And I think this, this tricky issue that's still on the table is that there are common universal responsibilities that you aim to sustainably manage your resources, but there are different responsibilities amongst countries and there are different levels of financing that will be required. And that's, again, an important, an important distinction, I think. Um, the final point on our um, discussion was around the climate change um, COP towards the end of 2015. And I think on this issue, land also has an incredibly important role to play. Um, we know that soil can be a carbon sink. So good management of the land and soil could mean three, they reckon three billion tonnes of carbon equivalent to 11 billion tonnes of carbon dioxide could be um, captured in the soil. But I think, and, and certainly from CCD's perspective, I think we think that the land has got the most important role to play in terms of climate change adaptation. Um, adaptation certainly will be felt, uh, sorry, climate change will certainly be felt first and foremost on the ground and not in the air. Um, some countries are already start struggling to cope. We saw, we heard earlier on the story about the UK and the flooding, but some societies simply have less capacity to adapt. UNFCCC estimates that it will probably cost us $83 billion a year by 2030 to protect the livelihoods of poor rural people in developing countries. Now, that's if we don't really adopt a sustainable land management approach. We think actually that the land-based solutions that we're proposing, the sustainable land management solutions that we're proposing, work. It, SLM could reduce the burden of climate change. So SLM is based on modern technology and also and largely on traditional knowledge and expertise. They tend, SLM technologies are fairly easy and they also look fairly low cost to implement. So we could reduce the cost of adaptation to climate change and use more appropriate local solutions for adaptation. Um, the upside or <laughs> downside is that actually SLM does tend to be fairly labor intense. But we would hope that that could keep young men, young women who are currently unemployed in employment and without any or many additional inputs. Um, to put it simply, I think if we don't manage the land and soil effectively, at least in most countries, we will not be able to address either climate change or land degradation adequately. Um, we're look, really looking for a more holistic vision of soil management and land use to improve the ecosystems and prevent economic losses. Um, and it's, a, it's an interesting time because the political discussion around um, adaptation is more focused on the issue of loss and damage. Um, as part of the Cancun adaptation framework, parties uh, were trying to consider, this is UNFCCC parties, were trying to consider approaches to deal with how countries pay for the loss and damage associated with climate change. Um, the International Mechanism for Loss and Damage came about at the Warsaw Climate Change COP, and they're, they're now kind of developing what that will mean. The challenge with loss and damage is that there's no real clarity over who should pay, who should kind of get engaged. And so I think that um, 
what we're looking at with land-based adaptation is a way of having a positive agenda rather than a negative agenda. At this point, the discussion around adaptation is saying um, we don't want to we don't want to pay for the loss and damage associated with climate change because the share of our responsibility for the loss and damage is difficult to quantify. If we can approach loss and damage in a more positive fashion with adaptation, it's a, it's a positive agenda around which we can build some sort of uh, community and common opinion and move the agenda forward. So a positive agenda rather than a negative one. But as with all positive agendas, there are some challenges. And I think one of the critical bottlenecks is around uh, rights. And that's the other policy issue that I think has to be sort of taken, taken fairly squarely. Um, in rural societies, the poorest people often have weak or unprotected rights, particularly over natural resources. Um, giving women the same access to men to agricultural resources in developing countries would raise farm production by 20 to 30 percent and increase total agricultural production by up to 4 percent in some countries. And that's a huge uh, bonus financially for, for poor societies. But getting land tenure rights, getting those things clear really, um, really is one of the bottlenecks to scale, scaling up sustainable land management climate change adaptation, any of those issues. So I think that's definitely a, a bottleneck that needs addressing. So what can you do? What, what's the role of ELD in all of this? Um, I think clearly um, the economics of land degradation, the case studies that you're doing at whatever level, um, are the evidence needed for action. Um, you can tell us <laughs> whether um, there's an economic case to be made for investing early in disaster risk reduction. You can tell us whether sustainable development goal, a target around land degradation neutrality, would pull people out of poverty. You can tell us whether climate change adaptation, land-powered climate change adaptation, would be, um, would be the way to go. And I think Building that evidence for action it is very important in terms of the future. Um, I think that we suffer from a very much a lack of awareness about the importance of land and soil. Um, next year will be 2015, will be the year of soils and the economics of land degradation will be producing a series of publications to throughout the year that support that agenda. But I think we need to really resonate with our audience. So if you're working in a country level, you need to capture what is the um, what is the issue that will attract policymakers there. And it, it's very, very different in different parts of the world. Um, land and soil need champions and they need advocates. Um, and I think bringing together on these key themes and advocating for land and soil within these key themes is something that as an international community we need to do. I think we need in innovative financing at uh, around land and soil issues. I think we need to think beyond um, traditional overseas development assistance. We need to think private sector finance, we need to think uh, innovative investment models, um, management of the land and soil is fundamentally a productive activity. Um, most, most land transactions, in fact, are undertaken by the private sector. So how innovative can we be about plugging the financial issues and the financial gaps? Um, I think we need to build synergies with other issues. So as, as ever, we talk about issues from our own perspective. But I think what we need to do is try to be the solution and not the problem. So rather than talk about the negative implications of land degradation, let's talk about the positive opportunities of investing in sustainable land management. How can we help avoid disaster? How can we help build a bright, sustainable future? And how can we help um, the populations adapt to climate change in a constructive, financially viable way. Um, and I think my final point probably, and this is my probably area of, uh, of passion and interest, is about building partnerships. I don't think that we as an international community, certainly not as the United Nations, which does um, 
negotiations between governments. I don't think that we can achieve anything if it's not done in partnership between governments, civil society and the private sector. And I wanted to just flag up uh, the private sector partnerships that we are working on at the moment, which are potentially kind of interesting. Um, we see that there are kind of businesses that are taking on sustainable land management, taking on investments in um in small smallholder farmers, trying to increase the um, increase the policy awareness and get the policy framework right, we're working with World Business Council for Sustainable Development and their partner companies to develop a soil leadership academy, which will um, hopefully build the capacity of policymakers to frame the policy policy environment better. Um, World Business Council also has ad adopted a, a um, societal must-have as part of their Action 2020 programme on land management. And the UN Global Compact, with its partner companies, is developing a um, developing uh, soil principles to be submitted to the General Assembly later on this year. So... What can we say? I think that um, there's a lot of challenges in land management. There's a lot of challenges in making the case that this is an interesting issue um, within the global policy context. But um, the next 18 months will be an incredibly exciting time. There's a lot going on. The evidence for action that is being uh, developed by ELD and by the stakeholders in ELD is going to be critical to making the case uh, for land and soil within these international policy contexts. So it's an idea whose time has come and we're delighted that we're working with ELD and with you all. So I'm going to stop there and leave uh, the floor open to some questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Louise, for this great presentation on policy. And I very happy that you showed us how we how the ELD MOOC is really part of an, a global uh, engagement in combating uh, land degradation. So thanks a lot for that brilliant uh, presentation. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I see people clapping. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs> I have to apologize for to those who joined the meeting uh, later who had trouble getting in uh, because the link uh, was not working properly or one of the links on the platform was not properly. I uh, fixed it uh, during the presentation, uh, but um, yeah, sorry for, for the inconvenience. Uh, today we have a sort of recording that won't allow us to take audio questions. So if you have a question, uh, please uh, write that uh, in the chat. I see Jennifer has joined the meeting. Ephraim in Rome has joined the meeting. So if you have any questions, please write them in the chat. Meanwhile, I've got one. Uh, Luis, you were uh, speaking about uh, private uh, sector partnerships. And uh, I was wondering, usually we hear a lot about uh, obstacles and uh, uh, problems uh, working with the private sector. Uh, what would you say is um, the... Um, really most uh, or the issue about land degradation that is most attractive to business uh, sector? Yeah, um, I, I just saw the question from Surya as well. Yeah, um, yeah I, in fact, it's, it's interesting. I think, yes, uh, private sector follows the profit. <laughs> As, as I hope that we, I hope I'm not being too politically incorrect. Yes, of course, they follow the pro profit. The idea of the private sector being involved for um, environmental reasons in the sort of the fluffy definition of environmental reasons, I think is, is, is not right. I don't think that's likely to happen. However, 
when you talk to one of you talk to the companies that we're talking to now who've got a real interest in the productivity of the land and soil i mean agricultural companies forest companies water companies mining companies um that whole group um, of companies that are generally quite related to the to the soil, it's a fundamental part of, of how they're now planning their um, their strategies. If you look at, um, there's a couple of companies actually that are worth looking at. Puma has got an interesting entire value chain approach, which which looks at environmental profit and loss accounting as part of their business agenda. And the company that we're working with quite a lot at the moment called Syngenta has got something called a good growth plan, which looks at their business model. Um, And I think that they are, um, their interest in doing it is looking at the fact that if they don't have productive land and soil, they won't sell any, any products. So, you know, for example, the Syngenta company um, are seed manufacturers. They won't sell any seeds if the land and soil aren't productive. So there's a real business interest for them to be involved and for the policy environment um, to be involved. Now, what we we do have to be careful about companies that want to greenwash. Yeah, we try to avoid companies that are just getting involved to say that we're doing something environmentally friendly. I think what we need to look at is is the whole value chain of where the company's going. Um, Honestly, we we tend to see that many companies are being more, um, at least on paper, (laughs) more proactive than some governments because they can really see the immediate impact of land degradation on their business opportunities. And there are business opportunities out there. Um, I'm sure in the ELD interim report, it talked about um, closing the yield gap on the productivity of the land and soil, leading to $1.4 trillion of increased agricultural production. That's a lot of money. And business follows the money. So, um, yes, I think we, we have to be careful that companies don't greenwash what they're doing. They aren't doing it just for public reasons. And it is about value chains. But they're co- they are a big part of the problem. They have to be part of the solution. We have to bring them on board. It's not mm-hmm. an option not to. So here's a question. Are there any incentives for the multinationals to adopt clean technology? Um, there are, <laughs> there are incentives um, in different countries. There's not not a global. In- I mean, there's the Clean Development Mechanism under the um, the Climate Change Convention. Um, I think that un- under this convention, we don't have financing like that. I-, I-, I think for us, it would be more a question of moving away from perverse incentives which is fairly controversial, but we are, we currently provide perverse incentives for things like fertilizer. So we're actually driving land degradation by providing government money for fertilizers to increase production, where in fact, if we could realign that the money that was invested in, in fertilizers perhaps we could change the the land management model and invest differently. So I I, I think there's there's a move in that direction, but there's nothing kind of as a major sort of incentive structure at this point. Mm -hmm. There was another question in the chat, uh, uh, how to convince uh, the uh, private sector, whether that means that we have to talk about profits or not uh, getting profits. I think we have to talk about opportunities, opportunities in terms of, um, and yes, I mean, do, do we have to talk about profits? Yes, probably, um, but the right type of profits. Um, and companies are part of a, of a community. And so I think we have to talk about profits in terms of the reliability of their supply chains. So they re- rely on supply chains. And if their supply chains break down, because the um, the process isn't that the land isn't being sufficiently well managed that they can't get the ecosystem services. That's a big issue. I think we can talk about um, the right kind of profits in terms of um, 
lost opportunities. So I, I, the, there are huge markets out there. You know, actually, people who are in poverty in the rural in rural poverty are not consumers. There are huge potential in saying to um, to a company, listen, if you're investing in an emerging economy, but there's this entire group of people who live in um, degraded land who don't have any access to resources, if you brought their level of income up, they would also then be potential consumers of your products. So I think, yeah, yes, if we talk to the private sector, we need to be talking in their language. It's about, uh, it's about expressing um, the economics of land degradation argument in a language that speaks to, to business. Okay, here comes another question uh, about incentives. And are, uh, you were, I think you were talking about a uh, wrong kind of incentives already. Is, are there in major incentive uh, which might be more costly and thus less attractive uh, for the private sector now? Right. So, I mean, they are, well, on this one, you might give the example of something like biofuels. Uh, so, right. I mean, you might look at something like the biofuel sector and say, well, you know, you, you we have quite a lot of incentives for supposedly green energy. And that's right. It's green renewable energy, but it has consequences and implications for other things. Mm -hmm you might look at um, providing incentives to shift from biofuels or to find different types of biofuels or to find biofuels that were um, restoring and rehabilitating the land as well. So I, honestly, I think it's we're at a point where all of this is on the table to be negotiated. It isn't an issue that has come to the fore particularly. And I think this is partly the reason for, for ELD, for the evidence for action. I think we, we need ELD and we need people working in the field to identify what those incentives should be. Okay, uh, there's uh, another comment about Monsanto and establishing a soil leadership academy. Um, Not Monsanto. Um, I've been, uh, uh, yeah, okay, can you clarify that on the soil leadership academy? The Soil Leadership Academy is with the World Business Council for Sustainable Development. It's being prepared at the moment. The company that has put some of the seed funding in is uh, Syngenta. It's another seed company. It isn't Monsanto. It's World Business Council with seed funding from Syngenta. And what is the um, goal of that leadership, Soil Leadership Academy? The goal is to build actually the capacity of decision makers. So there will actually be an element of ELD that will build on the work of the, of the MOOC and of the ELD um, initiative because policymakers don't really know about the land and the soil. That's private policymakers and it's also public policymakers. And when they make a choice about how, where they invest their money, um, they really don't know um, what the implications of those choices are. For example, the biofuels discussion. Mm -hmm. So actually, the, the idea behind the Soil Leadership Academy will be that it is a, um, a simulation role play training exercise mm -hmm. that will that uh, policymakers, decision makers can see the implications of their choices. So if you do this, what will be the implication for income, employment, biodiversity values. So it will be really a sort of show and tell for, for policymakers and business people to try and engage engage more on, on the issue. So very much part of the advocacy exercise. Mm -hmm. Okay, so there'll be more um, learning experiences um, coming up. We hope Very so, soon. yeah. I yeah. think we'll do we'll do it as a simulation exercise in the first instance and eventually an app. So hopefully as a, a some sort of online app at some point in the future. There's an app for that. Absolutely. <laughs> Okay, thank you very much, Louise. Great presentation. Great uh, for clarifying all these questions. Welcome. We hope to see you sometime in the future and um, hope to uh, 
see that uh, land degradation really gets uh, combated uh, in the next couple of years. We're looking forward to support from everybody. My email is on the final page of the slide. Please do be in touch if anybody needs any more information. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Claudia. Thank you. For next week, I can't announce a speaker yet because we will select the um, speakers from uh, the final projects uh, that you are currently preparing. The final projects are due on uh, Friday and then we look at them and those of you uh, who are selected will be uh, next week's speaker. So I'm really looking forward to some great presentation at the very last uh, session of our ELD MOOC. Um, we will prepare, uh, we will get uh, to you uh, on the present, uh, about the presentation once we